Hi there, everybody, and welcome to today's AOP Live. First of all, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Philip Heidson, and I'm the Managing Director here at Art of Procurement, and I'm joined on screen by my partner at Art of Procurement, Kelly Barner. Kelly, thanks for joining me. Absolutely, Phil. Thank you, everybody, for being here with us today. And today's um, AOP Live, the format, if you've never been to one of these before, is really all about the questions that you have asked in advance and some that our team have put together to really pose to our guests around the topic of the day. Uh, we received a lot of questions for the registration process, so we've used some of those or paraphrased some of those as we go through the conversation um, today. Now, if you do have any questions as we're going through the session, there should be a box underneath this video where you can just tap in any question that you may have. And actually, that's the role that Kelly will be playing. Kelly will be keeping an eye on all the questions and comments that you put in that box so that she's able to bring those across into the session at uh, certain points during the conversation. So please don't hesitate to do that. Now, today's topic, the title of the AOP Live is Rethink, Reflect, Reexamine: Strengthening Global Procurement Operating Models. Procurement operating models is always a topic that I'm really passionate about and I always find really interesting to see what's changing, where folks are kind of in the maturity journey, and some tips on how we kind of adjust and adapt based on all the change that we've seen over the last few years. And we'll talk about if procurement itself is due for a change um, themselves in terms of what are the operating models that we should be considering. We'll be joined by Jake Taylor. Jake is uh, Procurability's Senior Director of Advisory. Jake has 15 years of strategic consulting experience, has focused really across the procurement value chain, including sourcing, category management, supply negotiations, org design, uh, pre and post merger integrations, you name it, Jake has played a role in, uh, in, in really everything there is to do in the procurement space. So it'd be great to get the benefit of his experience. So with that all said, Let's bring Jake on stage and go into today's conversation. Hey, Jake, there you go. Hey, everyone. How are you doing today? <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Award for enthusiasm right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. Got you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. And you know, we always tee up these questions or these sessions with the same question um, because it really helps us understand a little bit more about your background. And so I have to pose this to you. Mm. That is, did procurement find you or did you find procurement? Uh, excellent question. Um, procurement found me. Mm. Uh, I was a techie back in the day and was looking for a career change and something that could be more strategic, get me out of the office, working with clients, doing a little travel. Uh, and naturally, procurement was one of those, you know, just fund uh, foundational roles that touches all of those areas and mm -hmm. was able to find a great role in procurement. Now, I think you said a little travel. That might be under-egging it a little <laughs> bit. Um, I know in your bio, you said that you're looking for a client to take you to Antarctica. And, you know, if you find that client, then please allow me to come along for the ride. <laughs> um, but I think that you've taken the opportunity to travel as well through, you know, your career in procurement. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, a little less travel these days than, than you know, probably pre-pandemic, but uh, I'm still looking for that client in Antarctica. So if anyone's uh, on the line and, and has any, any work to be done down there, ha happy to be a part of that. Um, well, what we want to do today, as I teed up, is talk a lot about um, procurement operating models and if they're shifting, how to think about them, how to think about your current model, if things need to change. And what we did um, as a run up to today's AOP Live is we just asked a poll on LinkedIn. It's a snap poll on LinkedIn with our community to ask about um, uh, operating models and operating models that their teams uses. And so I brought this up on screen for everybody watching, but I'm going to read it out uh, just for anybody who may be listening later. Uh, and the question we posed was, which procurement operating model does your team use? And there were four answers that, uh, that were able to give through a LinkedIn poll. The results were centralized model, 45%. A center-led model was 33%. Decentralized model was 14% and a matrixed model was 9%. And Jake, I want to come to you just for your perspectives on that first. But before I do, just from a point of uh, language, like, could you just talk a little bit about the difference between centralized and center-led? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, right? So centralized is classic uh, command and control. You know, all operations within procurement uh, fall under you know, a CPO, and it's uh, no matter where the purchasing is being uh, originated from, anywhere in the world or any business unit, 
it is conducted by procurement in call it one office. And then a center led is a, a uh, policies and procedures and technology is controlled by that procurement organization. Uh, but the, the roles or responsibilities are say dotted line into either business units or, or financial entities. Mm -hmm. And so did the results surprise you or were they in line with what you would expect in the mini poll that we did? Yeah, a little surprise uh, that centralized is is by far the the top number here. Um, you know, we've been seeing, and I can get into later. You know, kind of some of the trends of moving away from centralized. Uh, I would say a lot of procurement professionals prefer centralized. Right, it's easier, better data, more control uh, in the process. But uh, we're we're seeing more uh, moving away towards the center led uh, or or hybrid type of of model. So I, I would suspect some of this is is centralized except for here or. Yeah. mostly centralized with a few exceptions. So it's never really fully a clean centralized, uh, especially with global organizations when there's, you know, post merger type of uh, entities within the fold, but a little surprising to see so many uh, of the respondents with a centralized model. Kelly, what were your thoughts as you saw that? Well, you know, it's interesting. My thoughts are actually very much along the lines of Jake's. If we had tweaked this question slightly, and instead of asking which procurement operating model does your team use, and we had asked which operating model does your spend exist within or follow, I have a feeling the answer would probably be all of the above. Um, you know, especially as technology makes it easier for self-guided buying, self-sourcing, mm -hmm. and there's always those specialized pockets of spend uh, that are handled in some unique way because of what they mean to the operation. Um, I suspect that the distribution would be slightly different. So interesting maybe to think about some of the ways that procurement's organization versus how the spend is actually being managed could differ. Yeah, I think it's going to be is what I find interesting. And this is something I'm really interested in kind of unpacking as we go through the conversation is that, you know, procurement organizations sometimes go on a maturity journey, which starts off with, you know, we're really decentralized. So it's like, okay, we've got to decentralize. So everything goes to a decentralized model. And then when you're in a decentralized model, it's, you know what, we got everything, we kind of got our arms around a lot of things, but is this the most optimum operating model for the organization? And then it's like, okay, maybe we'll kind of drop down a, a tier, if you will, and go to a center-led model and how that kind of journey kind of pans out, um, you know, depends on, on where they are on the maturity journey. That centralized isn't necessarily the, the be-all and, uh, be and everything that used to be as you started on a... Uh, uh, yeah. on a you know transformation program. And I would love to see, you know, the, the data behind this too, to show of the centralized, how many, you know, are, where are they in that maturity journey? You know, how new an organization, which industries do they fall in uh, and so forth? I think that'd be some interesting insights there as well. So as we really want to talk about two different areas in uh, the AOP Live today, we want to talk about the current operating models, some of the implications around those operating models, and then around driving change as we're looking, you know, as a function at how do we need to think about when to change, how to change the journey to go on um, to change. And to really kick that off, I'd love to know just from your perspective, we brought up four different um, operating models there, but what are some of the pros and cons of those most popular procurement operating models that you see? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and all of them do have pros and cons. And it's probably most important to note that, you know, there is no one answer for the, the you know, the best or the proper operating mm -hmm. model uh, for an organization. There's a lot of nuance there. And if I could, maybe I'll take a, a step back. And why are we even, you know, having this conversation? Why did I bring up this topic? Um, it, it, this is an old, you know, having this conversation of centralized, decentralized, what's the proper model, right? It's It's decades old. This is not a new innovative topic. But why it is relevant today is we are seeing more and more of our clients coming out of, you know, the, the uh, you know, supply chain crisis where lead times were through the roof. It was hard to find product, especially materials coming from Asia, that it was, you know, I'm sure this audience is, you know, tired of debating, you know, how do we become more resilient and how do we address mm -hmm. the supply chain shortage that, that uh, many of us face. The hopefully looks like some of those uh, lead times are returning back to normal. And now organizations are asking, OK, for the next crisis, whatever that might be, another pandemic, another uh, you know, supply disruption coming from certain countries where we, we bought, purchase our product. Can our organization be more resilient for, for some of those changes? And can we be better prepared, not just from a, a policy uh, or you know, a, a process or technology perspective, 
uh, but from a, from an actual operating model, mm -hmm. we need to put more resources in the local countries where we're doing our purchasing. So the, to move then to kind of, you know, why pros and cons and, you know, going back to this classic debate, given the, the new world that we live in, um, it, it's probably important to note, right, the, the journey that organizations take, you know, when they start implementing a, an operating model that a new organization that is not mature, all purchasing is, is done by the business, by the stakeholders. It's just go get whatever you need. We're growing. We need to be fast, first to market. You know, then uh, eventually the leadership says, oh, we need to put some controls in place. We need to, um, you know, have some procurement organization better manage our spend, more effectively manage our spend. So then they start implementing uh, a classic uh, central model, centralized procurement owned by the CPO. Here's our policies. Uh, you know, you're not approved to purchase whatever you want mm -hmm. uh, anymore. Um, and then over time, uh, as you noted out, uh, noted, Philip, that, you know, okay, now maybe centralized, you know, there's too much controls, it's too bureaucratic, it's too slow to purchase, we need to move some of that back to the business. So we'll be more decentralized, putting more power with the stakeholders, and we'll put more procurement with the local businesses. So the, the classic pros and cons between the two, to, getting back to your question is, um, you know, it's the balance between speed and control, right? And a decentralized model focuses more on speed of getting product faster to the stakeholders, whereas a centralized model focuses more on the controls, on, you know, ensuring that procurement is the, you know, the, the fiduciary expert of spending the company's money effectively with value, with the right suppliers, managing that risk. Uh, you know, there, there is no proper answer one end of yeah. the spectrum or the other. It's a balance for every organization. And I think hybrid has developed uh, to kind of be that middle ground between the effective speed uh, of, of procurement with the, the right controls, ensuring risk is, is properly uh, evaluated for all, all the supply base. So what would a hybrid um, organization, or organization design typically look like? So there's a, a centralized uh, ownership of procurement. So the mm -hmm. one body for policies, procedures, roles and responsibilities, uh, uh, creating what, what uh, a procurement should look like in an organization, but the alignment, so the tactics sit with the business so that we we'll call it a, a category manager sits in centralized procurement, but is focused on a business unit or a geography yeah. or a certain entity. So they, that they have that local perspective um, in mind when they're, when they're uh, you know, managing the customer service with, with their clients. Do you see, because uh, it's really fascinating, you know, you think about, you start the decentralized, then you're kind of going up, getting more control, then you're distributing, distributing a little bit more control back in the business. Is the end goal to ultimately go back to decentralized, but decentralized with, um, I, I, I hate using the word control because it, it supposes that we're a, you know, a control function, but, you yeah. know, oversight, let's say, and with strategically placing resources where we need them. Is that where you think we're heading? Or, I mean, I know you said it's very, there's no one size fits all, but do you see that um, as a potential kind of continuation of where the models yeah. may go? Well, the, the pendulum is always swinging back and forth, mm -hmm. right? And, and there's, you know, certain um, catalysts for, for why this gets looked at or why it gets addressed, right? A new leadership, new CPO, uh, a merger, uh, there, there's, you know, issues with say some outsource functions. And so we have to realign some, some of the roles and responsibilities that might not be working, but those aren't root causes, right? So a root cause for, for why this should be addressed or even looked at, right? Let, let's say a CPO comes in and she looks at her organization and metrics are being hit, customers are happy, you know, everything is running smoothly, great cycle times. There's really no reason to do, you know, a full org mm -hmm. assessment and potential shifting here. But if there are, uh, you know, suppliers aren't happy, their invoices aren't being paid, cycle times are very high, stakeholders are complaining, uh, a number of, of root causes, you know, that, that's the reason for, for really addressing this. And like we've seen, as I mentioned, in the last year with the supply chain disruptions and, you know, lack of supply, uh, that's another reason for, for looking to address some of these reasons, uh, some of these, you know, org changes. Um, so I think that's kind of why, you know, organizations are swinging from one end to the other. And my perspective is yes, that it is swinging more to a decentralized model, uh, but to do that effectively, because we've probably all seen when it's too decentralized, 
data suffers, uh, you know, you, you start seeing rogue organ procurement organizations mm -hmm. uh, f finding ways to procure outside of the proper channels. Uh, so there needs to be still some, I'll, I'll say the word controls, even though it does, I agree, have a, a negative kind of connotation to being, you know, the, the Orwellian control panel. Um, but there, there is that need for, you know, here's the policy, here's the process. Everyone should be following the same process, even mm -hmm. if you're in a, a different geography or a different business unit with your requirements being met, um, you know, uh, uniquely as, as needed. You, as I think about the different triggers of, you know, looking from stage to stage, and you talked a little bit about, you know, it's sometimes when there's something that's broken or there's, you know, perhaps um, some an organization is tracking net promoter score and the scores are really low or, you know, the field is like a, there's a burning platform to change. Um, you know, when I put my entrepreneurial hat on, I think, the best time to drive change is actually when you're when everything's firing on all cylinders because you're doing it from a point of strength. And I just wonder if you observe whether there are procurement leaders out there who are taking that approach of, I want to continuously improve. I just don't want to rest on my laurels versus there's a problem that's broken. I got to figure out a way to go and fix it. I, I wish more procurement leaders thought like mm -hmm. that. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think these types of fundamental changes typically occur when there is something broken and, yeah. and it's a, an acute issue. Um, I've seen when things are firing smoothly and everything's great, the economy's great, uh, you know, less emphasis on cost savings. There's budget, usually more from a technology. Let, let's look at our technology because that's an expensive one. So yeah. organizations might address you know, new implementations or, or which technology is best in class, which is a, a topic for another day. Um, but, but I will maybe also state that, you know, in my view, the procurement's role is customer service to its stakeholders. That's yeah. its primary call it mission statement is yeah. it needs to be purely focused on uh, achieving the procurement, you know, goods and services needs of its business stakeholders. You know, secondary comes, how do we more effectively, uh, extract value from our suppliers? How do we ensure our metrics are being hit? That's an output or outcome of, you know, servicing your supply base, right? We, we hear all the time, the number one complaint when there's a problem with the, the org model or processes is business stakeholders say, oh, I, I just hate working with procurement. It mm -hmm. takes so long. It's bureaucratic. They don't understand my needs. I'm an engineer at a plant. I have to go into the technology and enter a purchase request. And I don't know the tool. I have to learn it myself. I don't speak procurement. Yeah. Right? That's a classic trigger to address. Something needs to change within procurement. All right. Either. And there's a number of levers. It's not just operating model. Mm -hmm. Yes. The policy, the processes, the, the technology usage, uh, maybe operating model. Uh, you know, we, we, we often recommend that, you know, for procurement organizations that take their eye off the ball of customer service first, service your stakeholders, yeah. make them happy, is, you know, that white glove concierge desk approach where procurement should be done by procurement. The need needs to uh, originate with the business, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but from there, let procurement do it. Let us, you know, work with you on understanding your requirements, your needs. You shouldn't be happy. You know, we won't reject a PR, make you start over from, from scratch because you put the wrong cost center in there. Uh, you know, that approach of being customer service first, yeah. if that's in violation, if that's not occurring, that's a clear need for, for you know, uh, an address, uh, an assessment as uh, far reaching as potentially updating the, the operating model. Yeah, I really agree with the customer service first because that's where you may even be hitting your metrics or feel that you're hitting metrics. But if you have, if the perception in the organization is of, of you making life difficult or there's poor customer service, that's where the conversation happens when, you know, the uh, COO is in the car with the CEO, you know, on the drive to a manufacturing plant or to a conference or to a meeting where someone's saying, you know what, procurement's really making my life difficult. And when those conversations happen, it doesn't matter what your metrics show because that ultimately right. comes, you know, kind of organizational fact. And you got to really focus on that ultimately to, to change the hearts and minds of, um, of the execs to then be the ones that are pushing engagement with procurement if you're having engagement difficulties. Yeah, absolutely. We, we had a client that was so focused on cycle times as a metric, ostensibly to serve the, the customers to say, we, were, we wanna make you know, procurement as fast as possible. So we're mm -hmm. measuring our cycle times. But what happened over time was to, to kind of you know, uh, work on the cycle time measurement they shifted more of the burden to the stakeholders to do the, the quotes and find the suppliers before purchase request, request is opened. 
to reduce the cycle time. So that when a PR is opened, a lot of the procurement work has already been done. That's putting mm -hmm. the burden on the stakeholder yeah. at the sake of reducing cycle times. Yeah. That's not customer service. That's, that's, you know, a backwards metric then if that's what's happening. So I, I, Kelly, I want to come over to you because I, I think there's been some questions that have been coming in from the audience. I want to give you the opportunity to uh, pose uh, a couple of them to Jake. Absolutely. Thank you. And there have been. So, Jake, let me start here with you. A question from Darius. How do you think the application of machine learning and artificial intelligence technology, uh, you know, everybody now is being forced to answer the question, how is chat GPT going to change the way you do your job or we do our jobs? Uh, but how might developments in automation, increases in the user friendliness of automation, potentially start to influence procurement operating models, either in the near future or maybe longer term, if you have a thought on that? Yeah, very interesting and very topical. Um, my honest answer is it's, it's too soon to tell. Um, that, and that's not a way to try to dodge the question. But I think that you know, machine learning has been around for a little bit, but, you know, AI and chat, chat GPT, you know, are, are newer models uh, or newer tools, I should say. Um, how I believe this will affect and maybe the, the mid to longer term and not necessarily the near term, because I don't I don't see it affecting anything, you know, in the next couple of years, except for interesting and maybe some more insights and, and so forth. But I think that the tactical element of some of this can be reduced. So for buying teams, for offshore um, you know, downstream, if there's, you know, uh, below certain spend thresholds, uh, three bids and a buyer required, the teams that are doing that can definitely be affected by some of this AI where you could pull some of that information without having to do the calling or quoting, uh, pulling, you know, scraping off of sites, certain pricing, uh, if it's off the shelf pricing, I think for more of that tactical work um, that perhaps is outsourced today by, by some organizations, the need and headcount for, for doing some of those more tactical activities. Um, we definitely could see, you know, more automation. Um, we're seeing some of that today, but I think the heart of this question is, is more, you know, not routine automation and machine learning, but more of the, the customized or, or unique skill sets that, that a chat GPT can bring. Um, I think that's going to definitely affect for the, the downstream uh, procure to pay functions. Yeah. Now, actually speaking of headcount, and skill sets. Um, Mahesh asks an interesting question. You know, we're talking about the way that these teams operate, but in terms of the expertise that individuals have within the team, um, Manesh asks, moving aside from different types of models for a moment, are there new roles that are being created? And you might observe, Jake, that within, you know, as companies move from maybe centralized to center led, to some form of hybrid or, or matrixed organization, that it changes the different types of, of roles and skills that they need to have within the team. Um, but I remember for a while there having a, a dedicated data scientist or an analytics person that was a resource for the whole team was sort of the hot trend. We haven't discussed that quite as much. Maybe we've shifted our attention over to tech. Um, but any comments you'd have for Mahesh around specific role changes that tend to accompany these transitions from one model to another? Yeah, yeah, excellent question. Um, yeah, I do. I, I, you know, I'm still a big proponent of a center of excellence, which is not a new concept in of itself. But I think that will become more important with AI, with ChatGPT, with data uh, becoming more prevalent of you know developing insights from from data. That is at its heart a centralized role. So getting back to the center-led versus decentralized, you know, an analytics function, a center of excellence. So for data warehousing, you know, collection of, of you know, insights and market intel, you know, you, you can have great metrics and metric gathering, but is it insightful? Does it lead to change? Mm -hmm. That is by its nature a, a center of excellence type of, of role to, to perform, uh, which should be centralized clearly with, with local perspectives as needed, but there will be the need for more uh, data scientists, AI engineers and in intelligence uh, around what to do with this data that, you know, now there's more data than we know what to do with, right? With all the, the different spend and UPC data and, and, and cost data and suppliers, uh, it, it's the, the trick is gonna be how do we make all this data we're collecting insightful? Um, and that's gonna be the role of, of data scientists, absolutely. Yeah. Now, if I can ask one more question of my own before I hand you back to Phil to take the conversation forward. You know, we've thought about skills. We've thought about how tech has changed things. 
one of the things we talk about a lot is where category expertise needs to reside. And I imagine there's some interplay there with operating models. So some categories, you're going to have expertise within procurement. Some categories, that expertise is going to reside within the business. And then in third cases, it may be where you bring in an external expert uh, to bring in that market point of view and that true category expertise. Uh, what type of interaction do you see between how procurement is managing processes and some of those customer support things that we've talked about and where the knowledge actually resides around individual spend categories? Yeah, yeah. Classic uh, uh, question about, you know, bringing in uh, category expertise to service the stakeholders yeah. in certain areas where, for example, you know, marketing or legal comes from a very, you know, captive uh, industry and a lot of the the spend, you know, in a lot of organizations, marketing is very high and marketing will say, we all come from agencies, procurement doesn't have this expertise, we'll negotiate with the ad agencies, you know, yeah. we, we got this and we'll just come to you procurement, you know, for, for when we need a, you know, an invoice or sorry, a, a contract signed. So how do you then as a procurement organization, bring in that expertise to be able to, to provide that value uh, to, to your clients, to your customers uh, in, in legal and marketing or, or, or HR and so forth? Um, I would say along the maturity model, clearly as an organization tries to increase the, the spend that it touches, that it manages, you're going to need that expertise, right? You're going to need to have marketing experts that, that can speak the language of ad agencies. Uh, if you're, if you're going to be touching legal spend that, that understand, you know, RFPs with law firms doesn't really work very well. There's different ways of extracting value yeah. uh, and so forth. So yes, um, th there are as a mature, as an organization becomes more mature, you're going to need to bring in category expertise, but that also depends on you know the the spend and velocity uh, of negotiating with that supply base. So marketing, I would you know as a blanket statement say yes, you need to bring in marketing experts into the procurement organization, or maybe there's a rotational program where you know marketing professionals within your organization move from you know product to to procurement to to different type of marketing functions. Uh, within the business to kind of, you know, do a, a rotation type perspective. But if there's not a lot of um, spend, uh, maybe a classic example would be um, HR benefits, right? You don't need to negotiate your HR uh, benefits every year. You know, maybe it's every two to five years. You don't need a, a, a captive HR benefit expert within procurement. You can bring in an expert then, uh, you know, on a more ad hoc basis. So, I think it's 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 looking at you know the velocity of your spend, the size of your spend, the relationship with your stakeholders. Are they working with procurement? Do they involve you from a strategic perspective? Do you have insights into you know demand planning so you have a seat at the table sooner uh, as a procurement organization? If that's the case, then definitely you're you're going to need category experts in some of the more niche areas. Excellent. Thank you, Jake. Well, I can see more questions have come in while we were chatting. So Phil, I will hand back to you and then go take right. a look at those. Thanks, Kelly. And actually, I was looking off screen here because uh, it was a really good question about uh, organization design. I know that the team at Procurability actually just um, published a series. I'm just looking off screen because I'm reading it on my second screen here called Bold Procurement Predictions for 2030 Insight Series. So I would recommend anyone to Google that because there's a big section there on virtual um, let me see where it is, virtual organization design, which talks a little bit more detail about that, that we just don't have time to go into today, but uh, I know there's some content out there. So please, if you are interested in that topic a little bit more, go and uh, Google that series and check out some of the, the insights and thoughts there. Now, I wanted to follow up on one of the other questions, uh, Jake, you talked about being a fan of uh, a center of excellence model. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a minimum team size or spend or kind of how do you frame out when when a procurement group is big enough to justify building a center of excellence model around it or can it be done for teams of any size it's just a matter of you know portioning off a couple of people that are focused on process tools technology yeah i would argue any size any any stage of maturity uh could, could use a center of excellence right it's in in, in the earlier days it's you know how do we make our you know, spend categorization makes sense so we could do better reporting. Is there, you know, more uh, alignment on what our, you know, cost centers look like, what our commodity codes look like. And that and that's a role for center of excellence, right, of, of, of making sure the data, you know, the garbage in, garbage out, right? You can't make sense of, you know, we talked about with data scientists until your, your data's in, in a good spot. 
right? There's always going to be insights that that should be warehoused centrally. Uh, you know, whether it's a consulting report, benchmarks, learnings, the RFP. So if your procurement team is doing RFPs year in and year out, uh, is that data being collected somewhere? Are your mm-hmm. results, your um, you know, benchmarking of rates, so that you know you you have so much data that that just gets lost if it's stored on a hard drive or people leave. That yeah. there needs to be kind of that data warehouse for that. And it can become more sophisticated and bigger uh, as an organization grows. Uh, you know, another key metric is you know, de- developing the ROI of your procurement organization. Mm-hmm. So the best in class companies are maybe six to 10 X. They're, they're giving back uh, to the organization, to their cost. Uh, so if you could accurately calculate the ROI of your organization and it's in the positive uh, and there still is in a center of excellence, I would argue mm-hmm. it's, it's time to implement one. No, I know this. Uh, if you don't have the answer to this question, then please, um, you know that that's no problem. But it was you were talking about metrics? It just brought another question to my mind: is like, do you look at? Because um, I often get this question, and I don't necessarily have a good answer. Is um, my spend is X? How many people should I have in my team? You know, th- that's kind of a driver of whether I have an efficient or an effective or whether I should be hiring five people or 10 people or, you know, based on what the uh, the, me- the spend, which is always the metric that people look at to, to judge that. Do you, is there any kind of um, standard kind of baseline data or kind of how do you look at, at, um, at an org design when it comes to making sure it's scaled for the right level of spend? Yeah, there, there are definitely metrics for that. Uh, I don't know if I would use them as the Bible for what that means for your, your team. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's, it's spend as a you know, percent of revenue, but, but then you also balance, uh, you know, spend under uh, contracts, spend that is touched, the velocity of spend, the year-over-year savings. Uh, you know, I think at the heart of, of this conversation too, right, with operating models is if we are moving towards a more decentralized model for the sake of speed, which I think... Mm-hmm more organizations are doing, uh, you know, you will naturally increase, you know, speed metrics so cycle times, uh, customer satisfaction, and there will be a reduction in year over year savings of spend under contract, right? There's going to be less of an emphasis on, you know, cost takeout and savings, which is, you know, that, that center centralized perspective or bias mm-hmm. uh, with more control uh, for, for the sake of, of, of speed and, and, you know, supplier uh, performance. Um, so there are metrics to, to look at, you know, are, is my team right sized or are we too heavy? But there, there's there's nuances there. And I hate to give the consulting answer. It depends. But, mm-hmm. you know, is your organization focused on, you know, category or are they focused um, on, you know, a business unit? Yeah, uh, there's different needs there. And, and you might be more, uh, you know, organizationally resourced for uh, a localized perspective versus a centralized okay, we're going to manage all of our temp labor spend globally under one group, regardless of, of the geography. Mm-hmm. There you could probably streamline some of the headcount, but then again, you're forsaking yeah. the customer service, localized speed perspective. Uh, it's, it's one of those questions I think everyone's always in search of a single answer and there is no single answer. Um, yeah. How does geographic complexity um, impact what organization design you may think about from a, a procurement perspective? Well, it definitely does add complexity. Um, I, I would say when we look at this, if there's a you know globally uh, uh, footprint organization, that looking at where the spend is occurring, right? So, so mm-hmm. generally speaking, indirect spend should be centrally managed, and there's of course yeah. exceptions to that. Um, you know, facilities or you know financial auditing and and, and even marketing, right? We'll we'll need some local uh, perspective in buying, but for the most part, indirects can be central. Then from indirect, or sorry, for directs, for manufacturing, uh, you know, or for, for banking and with IT knowledge, that should be more uh, managed and owned by by the geographic centers, entities, business units, whatever it is that that is in different geographies. So then you have to then balance, you know, what is the proper uh, distinction between headcount that is focused on that spend from a centralized versus a yeah. decentralized uh, model or perspective. I'll also add what's interesting too, which is still in flux. Post pandemic, there's a lot of change of, of course, work from home or work remote. That changes this dynamic a little bit mm-hmm. about can you have a, you know, if classically centralized headquarters is in London, your team's in London, and you're moving more toward a decentralized model, could you still have that headcount in London, but say, working with Italy or, or, or working more yeah. remote 
where maybe the Italian team is remote anyway. So what is really, if it's roughly the same time zone, um, that changes the dynamic a little bit as well. Um, so it's, it's mostly around, I would say, looking at the spend. I will mention, you know, culturally speaking, uh, there's really no difference between, uh, you know, a, an operation in a, a low cost country or, you know, other, other geographies. So there should not be any, you know, differences in metrics or targets for one organization versus another, mm -hmm. just depend on which geography that they sit in. It's, it's an interesting point around how the work from home is changing it because traditionally you would, you would place somebody locally because I'll keep somebody locally when you're designing your org because you, you know, they're in the office with the rest of the team all the time. So it's a cultural uh, kind of connection, but if that doesn't exist, then it, it, it takes away some of the, the need to have folks located right. in that specific right. place. Yeah. Um, as long as the language is, is yes. I would say, that, like that's the, still a requirement. That's no, that'll never change. Um, and they, but, they still uh, need to understand, understand the culture, right? Cause yeah. you can have, you know, a team in Brazil. And uh, I mean, as I've seen managing global teams, you, you still need that connection between local stakeholders and somebody who they think is an advocate for them. And so Absolutely. sometimes that requires somebody who is, is local or has the language or understands regional nuances that perhaps centralized folks may not understand just because they're not in the market all the time. Absolutely. Uh, Kelly, I'm going to come back to you with uh, any other questions that we may have uh, received over the last 10 minutes or so. Sure. And, and I'll actually start, you know, Jake, it's so interesting you talk about the difference between centralization and localization. You know, to a certain extent, I think we've all just absorbed the location shifts that we've experienced over the last few years. But with a lot of the, whether it's digital procurement systems that we're using or communications platforms, I almost find I'm more surprised when I find out someone is near me, right? Because we, we, everyone is so accessible through all of these different platforms. So I think maybe that's something for, you know, certainly everybody listening and, and watching today to continue to think about and, and for all of us to think about going forward, you know, you can support a global organization really from anywhere. And so it's sort of two different decisions for procurement to make, you know, from a, uh, process consistency, I'll say that instead of control, type of a perspective or a decision-making perspective um, versus actually where is the team. Um, it kind of brings some different variation into those choices. Um, now, a couple of yeah. the, the questions that have come in. Um, I have one from Sathish. And I think what he's asking about here is the transition. So he's talking about how would it work for a global company with multiple regional centralized teams to bring all of procurement under one global org? Um, you know, do you recommend going first to centralized, first to center led, and then maybe a move towards centralized or working through something hybrid? Um, what do these transitions tend to look like regardless of where procurement is trying to end up with their operating model? Yeah, interesting. I'll, I'll try to uh, unpack that one sure. a little bit. So, so uh, I would assume with with multiple regional centralized teams, that might be an output of of some consolidation or, or um, you know, purchasing uh, mergers, I should say, right, of, of different groups then that that keep that core team in whichever location that they are. And as this organization is looking at, is that effective? What should we move towards given, you know, our, our different offices? Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably a big leap to go centralized with, with this type of uh, infrastructure in place. Uh, that that's a big change with regionalized teams. So this this is here is a is a classic, um, you know, call it matrix, right? Where you have centralized teams all over the world, I probably reporting up through you know uh, common channels. Uh, in my perspective, without understanding more information, is is a center led uh, is the most appropriate. Um, call it a path of least resistance given uh, mm. multiple purchasing teams all over the world. Uh, so moving under one global org with the exception of say a center of excellence. And, you know, I, I would still argue there needs to be one set of policies and procedures and documentation, but still focusing on that, uh, the regional purchasing. Otherwise the stakeholders in this company, this example, you know, we'll, we'll start seeing the effects of that and they will start complaining. And I used to have, my team and my purchasing locally here in this office, and now they've moved to to London or wherever. Um, I'm not, you know I'm slowing down my purchase needs, and that's unacceptable. Um, so a little bit of a center-led uh, approach mm -hmm. sounds like the most appropriate in this case. 
Yeah. Now you bring up stakeholders. Uh, Garrett's asked a question and I'll read it in first and then I'm going to broaden it a little bit. Um, so he's asked, how do you change engagement with stakeholders that reach out to procurement after the deal has been made? So if we think about sourcing project has ended, contract is now in place, you go into sort of that medium term where you're working with the supplier either directly or through systems. Um, you know, either specifically this question or more generally, if procurement is modifying or clarifying the operating model that they work in, how might that change the way that they engage with stakeholders at different points in the cycle? Um, and any sort of warnings or advice or, or things that you can point out so that people maybe don't fall in and make some common mistakes that might otherwise happen during such a shift. Mm. Yeah, we, we see this a lot. And this is, you know, where procurement is unable to to show or add its value when when the stakeholders are already negotiating, already selecting and saying, we have these people starting on Monday, procurement, please, you know, sign this contract and, and you know, allow us to, to issue the PO. Um, you know, this is probably first before even an org model discussion, you know, a, a policy or process discussion around how do you then showcase to this? I'm assuming the stakeholders here don't see the value of procurement. They're going to do it on their own. Maybe this is that classic marketing example of, you know, we, we negotiate with agencies, so we're just going to do that. Um, and then just have procurement, you know, rubber stamp it through. Uh, you know, th there's a bit of change management that needs to happen here where procurement needs to show to these stakeholders you know, we have the knowledge, we can take some of this burden of negotiating off of your hand. You're still the ultimate decision maker. Uh, we're just here to help facilitate the process. We could bring in some new thinking about, you know, how to squeeze rates or how to extract value or, or, or introduce some competition to make sure that any incumbents aren't feeling, you know, protected or safe. And that's obviously a way that, that um, you know, when procurement isn't involved, that can easily happen. Um, so first and foremost, I would say that that's, and it's a big lift, that's not an easy thing to do, but how do you, yeah you know, present to these stakeholders that, hey, procurement can uh, have a seat at the table sooner before mm -hmm. you select, uh, negotiate uh, your, your supply base. And then to overlay that, you know, to your question, Kelly, with, with the operating model, that could be an example of, well, it's a centralized model and the, these stakeholders are in a unique environment with unique requirements that HQ doesn't seem to understand or, you know, aren't, aren't paying attention to because they're not staffed or, or have the teams in place properly. So that could be another uh, clue around, okay, we need to look at, do we want to decentralize a bit more to have yeah. some teams sitting in this location where these stakeholders are to understand that local or you know, category specific knowledge that today these stakeholders don't seem to entrust with procurement. Absolutely. Because the, the operating model does exist in addition to company culture, individual procurement, either individual yeah. human or individual yeah. functional relationships. Um, absolutely. So there's a lot of different things to consider. Um, Phil, I'm going to hand back to you uh, for the, the last part of the conversation here. All right. Thanks, Kelly. And I wanted to build on that question, actually, from Garrett just a little bit. As you think about, you know, post-deal support, so post-contract signing support, is there a philosophy or a best practice that you see in how how engaged should procurement, how, how should the, the operating model be built in a way that continuous procurement's engagement after a deal has been signed, should I say? Because oftentimes you see, you go through the classic sourcing process, the deal is signed. Okay, stakeholders, it's on you. You deal with performance management, you deal with relationship management, you deal with governance, come back to us, you know, in two years when the deal is signed. Like, do you build in or do you attempt to build in um, more procurement uh, support post deal into the operating model? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's classic customer relationship, CRM, or I should say SRM, supplier relationship management mm -hmm. around. Yes. Once a deal is signed, especially with these, you know, large key suppliers where, you know, it, marketing or legal, right. That they, they don't want to use procurement because they, they can't do this. That's the value add that procurement organizations need, need to show that they can provide is we will, you know, be all things suppliers uh, except for the actual selection uh, of that vendor, right? You have your requirements, you you have as the budget owner, right? The ability to, to purchase whatever material and uh, service that you need. We will just be the facilitators of that process, including the management of that supplier to ensure that they are living up to the deals of the contract, uh, you know, the commercial terms of the contracts. Uh, that, that should be an easy sell to stakeholders to say, we will manage the QBRs, right? We will be the bad cop of if they're, you know, 
on-time performance violations or, or customer service or downtime, whatever the, the need is uh, in the contract or, or the KPIs in the contract. Um, that should be something that um, procurement should be showcasing. Um, and that's definitely an area on investment if it's not happening today. Sure. And I'm just actually going to jump in here with you, Jake, while we work on some, some tech stuff. Um, you know, it, when we think about what the right operating model is for procurement, and especially if they're moving from one to another, to what extent is this a conversation that should involve people outside of procurement? Or, you know, should we take C-level input? Should we be discussing with key internal stakeholder groups? Um, or is this something that internally we should be able to figure out potentially with a, with some form of third-party support um, and then sort of roll that out and communicate it out to the rest of the business? Yeah, so uh, a couple of, of thoughts there, right? So first one you just touched on at the very end of your question about um, change management, right? Yeah. So, so anything around org uh, clearly needs to have careful change management implications because we're humans when we hear org, especially if there's a third party involved doing this assessment, oh my gosh, is my job going to be on the line? Am I going to have to move to a new country or report to a new boss? Job responsibilities changing. That's usually not the case. Uh, you know, clearly, sometimes that can happen, of course, but usually when there's an assessment or looking at some of these, you know, changes that we're talking about, it's, it's not about a riff or anything like that. It's you know, streamlining the, the processes to be more effective as is, as I would argue, customer service, right? And there, there's a huge change management piece. And that involves, to the first part of your question, uh, understanding uh, with senior leadership, are they on board? Are they willing to fund this? Are they willing to back it? Will they communicate from the highest of levels? You know, the CEO, ideally, you know, if there's a big org change because there is a violation of, of customers aren't happy, procurement is slow, too many approvals required in purchasing. You took away my P cards and I'm not happy about it. <laughs> there needs to be a, you know, from senior leadership, we heard you, change is coming. You know, we're addressing some of these pain points. Uh, this will be a multi-year journey. Here's some quick wins that we could have. Uh, and that's vital for involving senior leadership on this assessment on what is the mission statement of procurement? What is some of those bottlenecks or pain points? How can they be addressed? Uh, you know, again, org changes can be a key driver of that, but it doesn't always have to be the org. It can be other levers, policy process, you know, center of excellence, data scientists, all these many, many levers to look at kind of addressing some of those. Excellent. And Phil, I'll hand back to you. Yeah, thanks for jumping in, Kelly. My, my webcam decided to turn itself off randomly, but uh, <laughs> we, we may able, were able to bring it back on again. So I want a follow-up question to that, um, Jake, is how involved and engaged should we bring kind of the stakeholders into the conversation around our operating model like how much of it is we're procurement and this is the model we think is the most effective for the business versus we're going to out and we're going to do focus groups and surveys and one-on-one -on -one conversations and bringing executives like what's the balance between bringing folks from stakeholders into the conversation versus being led too much by them yeah no absolutely bring in stakeholders do focus groups interviews Everyone will be honest. Every interview I've had with a business stakeholder about how is procurement at this company, you know, what are your pain points, what are your issues, they are more than verbose and honest about their feelings and how great it is or how terrible it is. Uh, I'll never forget one interview. One stakeholder said working with procurement is a Kafka-esque nightmare. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that, and that went on a slide to to senior yeah. leadership and said, "This is how your stakeholders view working with procurement." Um, and and from that is where change is really necessary and driven. Um, you know, I, I would advise this should be looked at at a minimum every five years. It uh, doesn't mean you have to do a reorg and, you know, org change and, and drastic update every five years. But to address this, to do those interviews, to get a, a pulse of, I, again, I would argue customer service first, you know, mindset of, you know, that white glove service is what procurement should be providing to its business stakeholders. And from that flows KPI tracking and all, all the other value add advanced tactics that procurement can do. Um, and that and that comes from hearing and listening to to the business first. Mm -hmm. now, do you have any advice on how to you know as you're going through that change, and that change can be quite disruptive of, of operating model from model A to model B, on how to make sure that you don't drop the customer service ball while you're going through that transition? Because 
it's easy to, as a professional, you know, in that situation, it's easy to think, okay, I'm going to forget everything that went before and all my old responsibilities because now my new job today is this. Um, and I just wonder how you think about that as you go through transitions. Yeah, I mean, it, it should be, you know, clear that the reason for the change is to shift more towards customer service. Mm -hmm. uh, and that and that should be the impetus for, for most all of this. If, if it is driven by, you know, we, we need to be more, cost focused or bottom line focused, uh, that's harder to justify when there's a big change as far as the change management messaging. Mm -hmm. Everybody should be able to get on board with, we, we wanna be more customer service focused and oriented. Uh, that, you know, that's a necessary change, but also one that's more palatable to, to businesses. And, and that kind of helps with that transition um, uh, is probably the way I would look at that. Okay, thanks. Um, and really one last question, just given uh, where we are from a time perspective. Um, and it's building on the question that actually Satish asked earlier, um, which we talked about the coming together of different um, models or bringing together different models. Now, you've got a lot of experience. We talked about this right at the beginning, supporting uh, procurement through mergers. So whether it's pre through post merger, what usually happens or what's kind of the approach that anyone in that situation should take to think about bringing two different operating models together? Yeah, this is not a focus, unfortunately, post-merger, right? Post-merger is usually about synergies and collecting synergy yeah. dollars to justify the merger in the first place for whoever blessed it and said, you know, here's all the, the value capture from, from doing a merger. Uh, org, because in nature it's, you know, hard and big and, uh, you know, there's already enough uh, concern when there's a merger about jobs and so forth um, that, you know, org changes are kind of a secondary priority. Versus yeah. is, you know, let, let's get those synergy dollars and then, you know, let's, you know, have the day one and see, see what happens. And then usually one to two or three years out is when someone says, okay, these two violate, uh, two operating models are in violation. So now let's address that. But it's already been now a couple of years of mm -hmm. an imbalance, you know, improper teaming and, and processes between two distinct organizations. I wish this would be addressed uh, post-merger as part of a, you know, a clean room pre-merger uh, approach but it doesn't often happen. Um, and as you then start to look at these two different models, like how do you start in terms of thinking what is the, the optimal? Or, and it's not necessarily a choice between A and B, it can be a hybrid of the two. Um, but how do you even start thinking about bringing together two separate operating models into a singular model? Yeah. Yeah, I would look at kind of the, the goals and perspective of, you know, if procurement rolls up into finance, the financial organization, are they in the industry that, that this, you know, merger exists in? Is, is it a bottom line focused, you know, mm -hmm. every shaved penny off of cost, you know, affects the bottom line and is super important. That would then be argument for more of a centralized model, uh, you know, more policies and procedures in place to ensure that there's compliance to, to rates and so forth and more purchase with, uh, you know, negotiated suppliers. Uh, if it is more, uh, historically say a tech oriented where speed is important and entrepreneurship and, you know, that you know, Kelly, you mentioned earlier about the culture of the organization that plays into org design. You know, I, I had a tech client that mentioned savings is a bad word, right? We, we don't mm -hmm. operate that way. We are, we are entrepreneurial and we want as few rules in place. We don't like rules. That's our, you know, maybe that's changed in the last year with, with some of the tech layoffs that have been happening. But that's going to be a different operating model that that would become, uh, you know, an output of of this merger. So, yeah, you know, I would look at kind of what is the, you know, perspective and needs of of finance and procurement in the organization. Is it more cost focused? Is it more uh, customer service focused? I, uh, repeating myself, would argue to be always more customer service focused. But that dictates a little bit around what that operating model should look like. All right, well, Jake, I want to uh, wrap up here and just thank you so much for your time and for the insights, the the expertise and the experiences you've been able to share with us today. And, uh, you know, that focus on procurement as a customer service focused organization, but obviously not one that says yes to everything, but that yes. has the customer in mind and the customer experience in mind in a way that perhaps we haven't always done that um, is definitely a, an important takeaway. So, Jake, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, um, thank you for the opportunity. And, and I want to thank everybody who uh, came, watched the video, listened along for being a part of today's AOP Live and who submitted uh, questions along the way. Kelly, thank you for bringing those uh, to Jake during the conversation. 
Absolutely. And, and just before we wrap, in case this is lost on anybody, Kafka wrote about a guy who woke up as an enormous gross bug. If mm -hmm. if that is how procurement is being characterized internally, you may have a little bit more to think about than operating models. So that's a great memorable visual for you to leave us with, Jake. Thanks so much. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, thank if you. Don't you remember anything else? Remember that. Yeah. <laughs> take that one away. Um, well, thanks a lot, everybody, again, once again, and we can't wait to uh, talk to you all again soon. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone.